For the last seven and a half years, I have been fortunate enough to be the host of a daily radio show. It's a talk show, and I do a lot of talking. I introduce guests and topics. I interview people. But even though it's a talk show, I have learned over the years, over and over, that by far the most important part of my job is not talking at all, but listening. I've also learned that listening well, listening deeply, Listening fully is really hard work. A few years ago, I interviewed the amazing writer Cheryl Strayed. This was after she had come out with her amazing book, Tiny Beautiful Things. It is a collection of essays that she had written. At the time, she had been an anonymous advice giver, Dear Sugar. People would write in with their problems, and instead of just being the usual paragraph or two in response, she sort of turned the genre on its head, and she wrote, amazing personal essays in response. During the interview, I asked her what it was like to get these letters, and this is what she said. The thing is about so much of what I do in my writing is I don't have a plan from the beginning. I have a gut impulse. I thought um, that it was an interesting situation to be handed all these questions by real people talking to me about their real problems. And in some ways, it's like the best writing prompt I've ever had. I've never uh, been able to write so directly to problems. I've always had to write in that more writerly voice uh, where you pretend the reader isn't there. In the sugar column, I get to actually write to a person. Now, I don't remember exactly what was going on in my head when she said this, but I know, having listened back to that interview, that whatever I was doing, I wasn't listening as well as I could have. This is a question I asked her immediately following what you just heard. You talk about real problems and amazing prompts. Just give us a sense for the kinds of problems people write in with. It's not a bad question in and of itself. She had been talking about the letters people wrote in with. I asked her this informational question about what people said. Because she's Cheryl Strayed, she had a great answer and the conversation kept going. But I missed something enormous. This was after she had written her wildly successful, beautiful memoir, Wild, after she'd written a novel. And here she was saying she'd never had this kind of a relationship with the reader. I totally missed that. Well, there's more to this story, but you're going to have to wait to hear the rest of it. To me, one of the really curious things about listening is that we're all taught from a very early age, scolded sometimes, to listen. We are taught how important it is by first our parents and then teachers or coaches, often by romantic partners who know immediately that we're not listening as well as we should. But even though we're taught how important it is to listen, we're never really taught how to listen. The implication is that if you're a person with hearing, if your brain can make sense of the sounds hitting your ear, then you know how to do it. And in a pure biological sense, I think that's true, but the kind of listening that I'm talking about here, deep listening, listening with your full self, that's not a given. We have to learn how to do that. That is more like a craft. It's like building a boat or playing an instrument. It's something that you can practice, something that you can work at, and something that you can get better at. Over the years on the radio, I've learned four things that, when I remember them, have made me a better listener. The key is when I remember them, because I fail on the radio and in person, in real life, all the time. Number one is when you're listening, you should only be listening. There is a beautiful idea out there of multitasking, the idea that you can do two things at the same time. Or even more alluring, and I think even more wrong-headed, the idea that you can do two things well at the same time. It's not true in general, and it's certainly not true when it comes to listening. You have to decide what you're going to do. Will you give your full attention, your full brain, your full ears to the person right in front of you, or will you be doing anything else? Tweeting or Facebooking or daydreaming. Sometimes we're doing something else without even realizing that we're doing something else. When you have a conversation with someone or you're listening to someone and instead you're just thinking about what you want to say, you're not actually listening. I hesitated before I decided I would tell you this next thing because it's mortifying and embarrassing, but I think important. Two days ago, I was giving a practice version of this very talk at work. I got five people together, we sat in a conference room, and I 
you know, just, just so I wouldn't make a fool of myself up here, I gave it to them. So for 13 minutes, I told them how important listening is. Then I went back to my desk and my phone rang and a woman called. She had a pitch for a future show and it was an interesting pitch. It's a, it's a worthy topic. As she was describing this possibility, this possible topic for a show, I got some text messages from my wife and I started to respond to her. I was texting back to my wife as this woman was giving me her pitch. And then I, I asked her a question. I could tell, I think, from the tone of her voice that she knew I hadn't been fully listening because we know. You know when someone's not really listening. This was literally minutes after I had just told a bunch of people to listen. We are in the middle of an epidemic of inattention, of not listening. Often, step one is putting down your phone. The second thing I've learned over the years is that we all have to get a lot more comfortable with silence. It's hard, right? That was maybe seven seconds or so. On the radio, we call it dead air, and it is the stuff of nightmares. It means that probably something has gone wrong. I've been dropped into the studio. I have no idea what the subject is, who I'm talking to. I'm just like a deer in the headlights. Or a guest has clammed up, gotten terrible stage fright. Or there's some kind of technical problem. A phone line has gone dead, or we've lost a connection to a remote studio. In real life, I think, as a society, we're almost as allergic to the idea of silence. Three seconds or so have to go by before, in a social situation, someone will say, that was awkward, that was uncomfortable. I think the reason that we're so afraid of it is in the power of that silence. We all know deep down that silence is intimate and something important can happen in a silence. So many times when I've interviewed people, I've realized, I've learned that when someone is quiet after I ask a question, it means that they're thinking about something and so often what they end up saying after is the most intimate thing, the most awkward thing, the most painful thing that they had to sometimes get up the courage to say, I think we all have to do a better job of listening when people are talking as well as we pay attention and listen when people are talking. A lot can happen if we honor and respect that silence and get just a little bit more comfortable with it. The third thing I've learned over the years is that you can't assume you know what the person you're talking to is going to say. We do this all the time without realizing it. When you first meet someone, it's so easy to make some quick assumptions about superficial things based on the way they look or their accent or what they're wearing or what you think you know about their story. When you do that, it's so, so hard to actually listen to their real story. It's hard enough when you're meeting someone for the first time and you make those assumptions. When you're talking to someone you've known for a long time, when you're talking to a friend who has told a story that you think a thousand times, you could basically tell that story for them, a joke that you've heard a thousand times, or sometimes the hardest thing, an argument with a loved one, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a husband or a wife, when you feel like you're stuck in the rut of that same argument, you might think of it as having a buildup of cynical earwax. There is a filter between your brain and the world, some kind of jaded screen, and what is actually happening is a good chance it's not going to get into your brain. You think you know what the person is saying, and once you make that assumption, you're not actually taking the world in. Now, these first three things can make it seem like listening is a chore. Listening is hard work, and to some extent, it is. We're talking about giving your full attention using full intention when you do this. But if you actually care about what the person you're talking to is talking about, if you can't wait to hear what they say next, everything else falls into place. The fourth thing I've learned is that sometimes you simply have to make yourself care. A few years ago, I was at a wedding of one of my wife's cousins. And, uh, I find myself talking at the reception to the father of the bride, a, a wonderful man who had recently retired after decades of a career in the wholesale linen business. Now, if before the wedding you had asked me how much I care about 
what it takes to sell towels to a hotel or bed sheets to a hospital or tablecloths to a restaurant, I would have said, I don't, I don't think I care that much. But it was a lovely wedding, the drinks were flowing, he was a lovely man, and I found myself caring. I decided on some level to care. And I learned a lot about linens that day. I learned that industrial washers and dryers are fearsome machines that can really rip these things to shreds, and so it's all about the weight of these things. I learned a lot about tablecloths and towels and sheets, and in the end, even though it was a fantastic wedding, what I re remember most, what I really, what stands out to me is what I learned about towels and sheets. <laughs> if you were listening well earlier, you remember that a couple years ago, I didn't listen well at part of a conversation I had with Cheryl Strayed. She had told me something really amazing uh, about getting these letters, and I had missed it. Well, because she is a really generous, giving person, I thought she wouldn't mind if I emailed her and asked her if I could ask her a question. I should have asked, asked her years before again. So a few weeks ago, I did that. I emailed her, and I said, can I come over and ask you some questions? She said yes. And I sat down with her, and I asked her who she is writing for, and this is what she said. It's a question I've been trying to answer for myself as a writer all of my writing life. What's true is that two opposing things are true at once. On one hand, I don't think of the audience. I have to write um, what comes out of my heart's truth. I also really want to please people. I write because I want people to love what I've written. We talked a little bit more about this idea of her wanting people to love what she has written, and then she said this. My mentor is George Saunders. I, he worked with me at Syracuse University. And one of the truest things I ever heard about writing is he said to me, I write because I want people to love me. And when he said that, I thought, me too. That is so what I want. I want to be loved. I wanted to play these clips for you because they taught me something that I, I don't think I had realized before I went through this process. And I was very lucky, obviously, to be able to realize I'd missed something. And, because it was recorded. I could go back and actually talk to her a second time to get a, a second whack at the ball I had missed. I learned the one obvious thing is at stake in listening well is, is really taking in sometimes a gift that somebody has given you, taking in the world, connecting with a person in real time, in real life, right in front of you. That's the first and most obvious thing that's at stake here. The second is more profound. It's foreclosing so many possibilities if you don't listen well enough, so many roads you can walk down because you've taken the time to listen. You don't even realize what you're missing when you don't listen well. In my case, I never would have heard Cheryl Strayed say this deep truth about wanting to be loved. And in the end, clearly that's not just a truth about being a writer or being a radio host. It's true for all of us. We all want to be loved. And what is listening well, listening with your whole head and your whole heart and your whole self, your whole soul? What is listening so well you could crack yourself open and be changed by what you're listening to? What is all of that if not love? Thank you.